of the conversation, right? So. <laughs> Definitely. And so, and, and all of you are here at this office then, or, okay. It's, I mean, I was like, there's nobody here, but it's because you guys are I know, it's a very funny background. The Credo offices where no one works. <laughs> I know. Right. Why were you looking at me when you said that? I was totally not even looking at you. You don't even sit over there. Um, so I was hearing about how you guys had, you had Senator Sanders and Senator Warren here not, not too long ago, or? Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> Right. Well, you can, I'm sure now you can invite all the presidential and candidates and that would fill up your calendar until the end of the year. <laughs> so true. Um, Once a week. <laughs> what about the others that, that, um, that you invite? I mean, any other? Let's see who's been here. So yeah. Shauna from Ultraviolet was That's here right. and uh, Nancy from Social Security Works. And Rashad from Color of Change a couple of years oh, ago. Oh, And fantastic, yes. Richard Cohen from the SPLC was here with uh -huh. Heidi Byrick, who does the hate oh, watch oh, right. stuff. Yeah. Um, um, oh, yeah. Faz came. Now the campaign director for Bernie Sanders came when he was at the ACLU. Right about now. Yep, our Walmart was here. Yeah. And um, Michael Waldman from the Brennan Center was here. Fantastic. Okay. Um, Which is, so there's a trend, everybody is social justice yeah, oriented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we generally yeah. try to bring in folks that we are, who are from groups we fund. Great. So right. that we can, you yep. know, like. And you can see the tie to your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Directly. Definitely. Well, with Title X, just having been in the news, it feels like a good one to, totally. to, I know. to that's, talk about. That's about. question so. number two. Excellent. Oh, <laughs> question number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's huge. And so, I mean be curious to hear all the things that you right. think we could be doing to support and explaining it to people because right. I don't think people understand that's right. That's right. what the so, risks are and yeah. why it's a fake problem that they're trying to solve in the first place. Right. Um, right. Well, there's a lot for us to talk about. <laughs> Half an hour. <laughs> okay, are we getting close? Should we be paying attention to the countdown? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Does anybody have any questions now? This could be yeah, your chance to ask a true. question now. Were you hearing that? Um, okay, fine. <laughs> well, let me ask you. What, yeah. what brought you here? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so somebody asked me a question. I'm going to ask you. Oh my gosh, the most crooked path, but um, so I was a teacher for a long time, a middle yes. school teacher, and I was, uh, my husband started Color of Change. Uh, really? In oh wow. 2004, 2005. Oh, right. And so I was like doing lots of Color of Change yeah. things. You're just talking to us, you're from, very Because it was in our house and like three people for a long time, mm -hmm. as it as happens. And so through that, I got to know Becky. Okay, who I just was, want to make sure that wasn't the real, the real you. Oh, he's not talking. He, uh, she was the political director in at that time, and was looking. I, we had our first one was like two, and I was thinking I would go back to work. I'm not sure if I wanted to go back teaching full time. She was like, "Oh, come work with me." Mm -hmm. And so, like, I did part time to full time to campaigning, and here I am. So, not the usual path to this work. But right. It's fun. Okay. Great. And I still get to do some color of change stuff I'm on the board, yeah. which is really nice. Oh, that's they're doing so fantastic. Such good work, and yes. you guys are in partnership with them yeah. on yeah. frequently on I mean, through progressive yeah. partners, yeah. Yes. through yeah. our political work, yeah. through just general yeah. advocacy work. Given yeah. that that's what ties okay. to the lives of our patients. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, that's a funny path for me. But now here it's I great. That's awesome. So, and you've got such a beautiful. I love the space. Yeah, so. it's really nice. Okay, it's a funny. It's funny to be in the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, to go through I know, airport security right? every day. I know, stuff, but right? it's a really good space. We love everything about the space, but our carpet. The carpet. <laughs> We're a minute out. Oh, so I shouldn't be ruminating about the carpet. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't actually answer any questions. The carpet is really distracting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I notice it. <laughs> Way to go, Trish. <laughs> no. Your 
we're okay. Yeah, just for a second. This is the most fancy lag that we've Could you move that uh, black jacket that's on the Oh. <laughs> Whoever's jacket that it is. No. I have a job classification thing here. <laughs> yes. Yes. One minute. This is the awkward part. I know, sit. right? Like, I don't know if we should talk. No. I know, right? Like, are we on something? Do we need to be focused? Oh no, no, we're looking at it again. Thirty seconds out. Twenty seconds. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Heidi Hess. I'm one of the co-directors of Credo Action, and I am so excited to be here today with Dr. Lena Wynn, who's the president of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Dr. Wynn came to Planned Parenthood recently after almost four years as the health commissioner of the city of Baltimore, and she's the first doctor to lead Planned Parenthood in nearly 50 years. Uh, Dr. Wen is new to Planned Parenthood, but Credo and Planned Parenthood go way back. Um, thanks to Credo Mobile, Credo Energy, and in the way back, working assets, long distance customers, um, we've given almost $3.5 million to Planned Parenthood and its affiliates over the last 30 years. Um, and we go back on the action side too. Credo members have stood up to defend Planned Parenthood against right wing attacks, and we've worked side by side with Planned Parenthood to fight for reproductive freedom nationally and in the States. Um, it's an honor to get, to get the chance to be in conversation today, and since we have a short time, Time, I'm just going to jump in if that works. Absolutely, happy to be here and I would be remiss not to thank you so much and thank you, Credo for your strong support of us over the years. So we really appreciate it. Oh, it's an honor to be able to support you in the ways that we have. Um, so my first question is a little bit long because when we were preparing for your visit, someone on your team reminded us that you come from a medical and not an activist background. But when you were Baltimore City Health Commissioner, you issued a blanket prescription for the opioid antidote to mm -hmm. all 6,200 6, residents of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. You led campaigns treating gun violence as a contagious disease and racism as a public health issue. You sued the Trump administration for cutting teen pregnancy funds. And you we won. <laughs> Which is important. Sued and won. You organized thousands of doctors and health professionals against Trump's gag rule, and you led a lawsuit against the Trump administration for uh, sabotaging the Affordable Care Act. So that feels a lot like activism to me. So can you talk about why it was important from your position as a doctor to fight for those things? Well, it's being a doctor that I know how important it is to advocate for our patients as part of providing health care. That in so many ways, health care is advocacy. The work that we do in healthcare in serving those who otherwise would not have access to care is advocacy. Yep. I'm an emergency physician and I'm, I remember, you know, I went into medicine, I think, for all the reasons that people go into medicine because I want to help people in their time of greatest need. But then I saw so many patients in the ER who were ill not because of the illness that they had, Yep. but because of something else that led them there. Mm -hmm. And so I remember treating this one woman who came in with a stroke and she was paralyzed on one side of her body and couldn't speak. But I then found out that the reason she had a stroke was that she was cutting her blood pressure pills in halves and then quarters 
She didn't have insulin. She couldn't pay for her insulin. And she went without access to health care. She couldn't get health insurance. That's why she was in her 40s and had a stroke and would no longer be able to work or care for her family. And yes, my job as the doctor is to treat her illness at the time that she came in. But there's also my obligation to fight for those policies that made her sick in the first place. Yep. I mean, I had another patient who was a young woman who waited for more than a year before having a lump in her breast examined. And again, it was because she didn't have health insurance. And by the time she came in, she had metastatic cancer and she died not long after I saw her. So my job is to advocate for her and to help mm -hmm. her but it's also to advocate for other patients and to fight for a better system of care that's keeping people sick. I know from being a doctor that keeping people unhealthy is a tool of oppression mm -hmm. and that stigmatizing women's health care and reproductive health care is a tool of misogyny. Mm -hmm. And that's why at the same time that we fight to provide access to care, we also have to be fighting against every bad policy that's keeping us unhealthy in the first place. Yep. Um, I, that's so important and, you know, makes sense why you made a decision to change jobs and come be at Planned Parenthood, right? Because you guys are providing the kind of health care, right? And access to health care that people won't have access to when they don't have insurance. And you're fighting the bad policies in such systemic ways, which leads me to my Next question, which is what are the attacks that you're feeling most concerned about now? And what are things that we can do to support the fight? And we were talking about Title 10 just before we started on the live stream. I assume that's a great place to start, but there may be other things that you want to talk about too. I appreciate that. I mean, where do we start sometimes, right? When right? I look at the, I look at my Twitter feed or <laughs> Facebook or whatever, and, and there are ongoing countless attacks. and not just by anyone, but by the president of our country who is spewing lies and misinformation. I mean, there's no better, there's no other way of saying than just pure lies in a deliberate misinformation campaign to confuse people mm -hmm. and to distract from the major issues. I mean, I, I want to talk about, I, I'm glad that you raised the issue of Title 10 because I want for everyone, for us to join in the fight against the Title 10 gag rule. This is Topical. This happened four days ago mm -hmm. that the Trump Pence administration issued their final rule for yeah. the Title 10, which is our nation's program for affordable birth control and reproductive health care. Mm -hmm. This is a program established nearly 50 years ago to provide health care. I mean, we're talking about breast and cervical cancer screenings, STI tests, HIV screenings. We're talking about primary care, preventive care. This is established for people who live in rural areas, people with low income and many individuals who otherwise would have no other access to health care. Yep. And this gag rule would dismantle the safety net program for four million women and families. And it's, it's unconscionable on so many levels. One is that it's removing access to health care. And we have to talk about that, that it's not as if Americans all have great access to health care. Right. We need more health care and not less. And this is removing health care from those who are the most vulnerable, yep. which I also think we have to talk about how this is discriminatory mm -hmm. because Title 10 provides for individuals with low income. It also primarily serves people, uh, uh, people of color, Hispanic or Latino. So you add another level of discrimination yep. that we have to talk about how this is perpetuating health disparities and racial inequities that are already so rampant. Mm -hmm. These are people who already have access to healthcare who uh, already have difficulty accessing healthcare and we're adding another level of difficulty on top of that. And then the other part that I think we have to talk about is the gag rule component. And just to put a finer point on what this gag rule is, it is saying that President Trump is telling doctors what we can and cannot say to our patients. That President Trump and politicians are saying to doctors that we now cannot provide factual or medically accurate information to our patients. So it's not even clear, by the way, so this is specifically about abortion referrals, that, um, that patients coming into a doctor, um, if they're going to see a doctor who receives Title X funding, that that doctor or nurse cannot provide information about where to get an abortion, even if the patient specifically requests information, right? Even if the patient specifically asks for it. And it's not even clear if it's medically necessary. Right whether doctors are allowed to provide that information. I mean, what kind of world do we live in, right? And it's, you know, we, 
I and other doctors have been talking about how this is so unethical and unconscionable. Right. That this forces us to violate the oath that we took when we mm -hmm. became doctors. And the answer we get back from those who support this gag girl are, well, patients of the internet. They can go on the internet and find out. <laughs> and I just want to say, I mean, how can I as a doctor face my patient and say, President Trump is not allowing me to give you information. You can go on the internet to find out information about your health care? It's just not something that we're prepared to do. No. And so that, I think, is one just one example of the types of battles that we're fighting. We're fighting on every front, right? This is about health care access. This is about patient rights, yep. about keeping politicians out of the exam room. And I think we also have to talk about how this is yet one more attack on the right to safe legal abortions. Yep. How President Trump and so many kind of anti-reproductive health and anti-women's health people, they are talking about all kinds of things, but actually masquerading their true intention, which is to take away our right to health care and ultimately to take away our right to bodily autonomy. Right. That's back to the misogyny at the core of what they're trying to do, right? That women actually wouldn't have the freedom right. to be in control of our bodies. Right. And, and it's not only women, it's all of us. Right. That if, and I think we see this with so many of the attacks that are happening. I mean, for me as an immigrant, seeing the public charge rule right. and what's happening with the attacks on immigrants and on our rights. I mean, when my parents and I first immigrated to this country, we depended on Medicaid, we depended on food stamps, we depended on WIC when my mother was pregnant with my sister, she depended on WIC for just for nutrition and, and, and food assistance and, and health care. This, this was not some entitlement, this was our lifeline. And we also see the attacks against LGBTQ people, mm -hmm. we see attacks against people with low income, we see attacks against all of us. And I think we need to see that an attack on one group of people is an attack on all of us. That if any of us are not, are, don't have bodily autonomy, if any of us are being attacked because of our identities, then it's attacking the health and rights for all of us as a country. Yep. You're, you're giving me such good transitions to my next questions um, because in February, Planned Parenthood joined dozens of progressive groups in calling on Ralph Northam to resign after it was revealed that his medical school yearbook entry contained a photo of someone in blackface and someone in a Klan robe, um, which you know, holding a, you know, the Virginia governor accountable for racism doesn't necessarily seem like it's in the the lane of Planned Parenthood, yet it felt like clearly something important for you to do. And I'm curious you're, you know, why that was a decision that you made and why that was a fight that you guys chose to jump in on. Reproductive health care doesn't function in a vacuum, just like health care doesn't function in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that I know so well as a physician and also as a public health leader that for so many of the patients who come to us, well, right now, the issue, the reason they're coming to us is for birth control and for IUD. But they may also be telling us that they have issues accessing food. They yeah. may have issues with transportation. They, they may be issues with affordable child care. And we know in medicine, too, that there is profound racism and profound health care disparities mm -hmm. that are based on race, that are based on gender, that are based on geography, and so many other factors that tie together. And we would not be doing our job as a healthcare organization mm -hmm. if we did not pay attention to all these other issues. And so specifically with Ralph Northam, he is not just Governor Northam, he is Dr. Northam. And I thought a lot when the pictures of him came out, mm -hmm. not that long ago, right? We're talking about the mid eighties here. Right. What it must have been like for his fellow medical school classmates who are people of color mm -hmm. and what kind of message that would send to their patients then and now. And no wonder we have such huge, profound racial disparities that we talk now, there's, I'm glad this is in the news now, a lot about maternal mortality yep. and how the U.S. is the only industrialized country where the rate of maternal mortality is increasing. I mean, that's crazy, right? Yep. That that rate of women dying in childbirth is higher now than it was in 1990. But even crazier is that 
an African American woman today is three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman. Yeah. And even when you when you take into account social economic status and education level and geography, there still is that profound gap, and it's because of systemic racism yep. and profound disparities. And we have to call out that racism is a public health issue, and that we as Planned Parenthood <laughs> will just keep the show on the road. That is that is um, you know. And um, and that uh, we we have to take into account all these other factors that that impact people's health yep. in a in a profound and in a daily way. Yep. Thank you. Um, turning that a little bit to gender, um, you know, I know when I was a young person getting services from Planned Parenthood, and many people probably think that, um, you know, their conception of Planned Parenthood is cisgender women coming to get birth control, right? But I think that Planned Parenthood does a great job of both serving a broader group of people and expanding notions of mm -hmm. who needs family planning, who needs reproductive health care, who needs the kind of services that Planned Parenthood provides. So could you just talk a little bit about why it's important to serve all genders and how you do it? I really appreciate the question and the opportunity to explain more about mm -hmm. the services that we provide. Um, I'm wearing a button now that says this is healthcare. Um, uh, just so I'm, I've been in my role now for three months and less than a month in, I and my team launched a campaign called This is Healthcare to illustrate first and foremost that the work that we do at Planned Parenthood is exactly what it is. It's healthcare. Mm -hmm. That sexual reproductive healthcare is healthcare. Mm -hmm. That access to safe legal abortion is healthcare, yep. that birth control is healthcare, that, um, that screening for breast and cervical cancer, STI tests, HIV, all of this is healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that we should not be stigmatizing and siloing out and attacking one aspect of healthcare mm -hmm. because all of this is healthcare. And similarly, we have to talk about how all of um, of what we do in Planned Parenthood, we don't just think of these services. You know, it's not like we wake up and say, which are the services that we can offer today? Since the beginning of our founding, we've always been about responding to the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. When we were first founded, information about birth control, even to married women, was illegal. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of crazy that not that long ago, birth control itself was illegal, although maybe not so hard to believe because less than 24 hours after American voters sent a record number of women to Congress, President Trump issued a final rule that would make, that would allow employers to deny women and all people birth control coverage, right? And so birth control is on the line now more than ever, but I, I, I digress to, to, to say that we've always been about meeting the needs of people and responding to those needs over time. So in a way, it makes sense that we are constantly evolving as an organization. So for all people, for women, for men, for all people, we have services that directly are in the in line with what we have always been about, which is sexual and reproductive health care. That includes our STI, HIV testing and screening. Um, we are one of the largest providers of HIV tests around the country. I think our most recent numbers are that in um, in the last in the last year, um, we screened more than 740,000 people for HIV. Um, we are the only national healthcare organization other than for the VA that has a presence mm -hmm. in all 50 states. We have over 600 health centers around the country. And we not only focus on healthcare, but we also focus on education. Um, we have millions of views to our website every, um, every month. We are the largest provider of sex education, especially at a time when we really need it. And one area that we're so proud of um, of expanding as well is around our care for LGBTQ people and gender affirming care. Mm -hmm. um, we now offer hormonal therapy for trans patients um, in um, more than 40 states. And that's something that we want to continue to expand. Again, not because we created the need, but that the need is there in our communities and we are responding to the needs of, uh, of people all across the country. Thank you so much. Um, we're, our time is ticking away, and so I want to return a little bit to the, the question about the attacks on Title X and 
the many other attacks because, you know, uh, the Credo Action Team and the whole team here at Credo and all the people watching, they want to stand with Planned Parenthood and take action to defend Planned Parenthood. And so I want to go back and just ask you if there are related to Title X, if there are things that you think are sort of the next ways to help shift things. I know it's partly going to be in the courts, but there may be ways that activists can get involved who aren't, you know, judges. But if there are any judges out there, defend Title X in the courts. Um, and if there's other issues that you think are on your radar, either in the states or nationally, that activists can be involved in. Um, I really appreciate that. And I um, also very much appreciate that Credo is all about taking action. And so that, and we're calling on all those who are viewing to be supporting <laughs> us in this effort as well. Um, so um, another issue, just to put on the radar, because you mentioned about judges, is what's happening now that we have Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme yep. Court and all kinds of judges with lifetime appointments all around the country. It is important for us to call out that the importance of judicial nominations. And that's another area where people might be wondering, well, why is a healthcare organization dealing with Supreme Court nominations and yep. judicial nominations? It's because these are lifetime appointments for people who will be forever, right, for generations to come mm -hmm. in charge of our health and our rights. With Kavanaugh on the court, just to give you one additional data point on this, we have over a dozen cases that are one step away from the Supreme Court that directly deal with abortion access. And if any of these are taken up, we could face a real situation where Roe versus Wade is further chipped away, yep. eroded, or overturned. And then we would have one in three women of reproductive age in this country, which is 25 million women yep. living in states where, where abortion is outlawed, banned, or criminalized. And that's when we think about what's at stake, that's what's at stake. It's literally about our health and our rights right now. And so in terms of action steps that we can all be taking, I want to call attention once more to Title X. Um, and I'm going to ask my team, there's a text number that we want for all of our, um, for everyone um, to join in this fight. Um, you can go to, um, so you can go to our, um, to our, our, our website, Planned Parenthood and find out more and I'm going to give you the number for what you can text in the meantime. I also would encourage all of us to raise attention because I think a lot of people don't understand what Title X is and then it gets jargony, right? We're talking about the gag rule, the intrusion on physicians. I think the most important top line message is this is about healthcare access for 4 million people in this country. Reproductive healthcare, healthcare, this is all part of, of, of healthcare access. So raise attention, um, raise awareness, um, write letters, tell your friends and family. Um, if you just, in, and for those of you who are, um, who are in California, great, and call your representatives in California, that's fantastic. But for those of you with family in other parts of the country that may have, you know, that may not, that, that may face this threat, but may not have um, as much attention called uh, in other places, please yep. um, please raise awareness of, of that as well. And now I have a wonderful team here and they're telling <laughs> me, here is our number. Text Title 10 to 22422. 22422. And that is another way to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to get involved. I really believe that this is the fight of our time. And, you know, and, um, and that if we are not the ones to step up, then who else is going to? Yep. Um, title X, 10, not title T-E-N, just to clarify. I don't know if both would work, but in case they wouldn't, title X. Um, <laughs> and yes, this is, I, I, I'm with you. I think the, you know, the, the Supreme Court keeps many on our team up at night thinking about those consequences and eventualities. So. We know that we are all in that one together across the progressive movement. Um, we probably have time for one more question. So I think I'm gonna ask about 2020. So um, if you were articulating Planned Parenthood's dream platform for the person who becomes the Democrat, Democratic nominee, um, one of the 150 of them, who beco whoever becomes the nominee, uh, what would it include and what would be non-negotiable? Actually, it's simple. It's that reproductive health care is health care. Women's health care is health care. And health care is a human right. That health care is something that must be guaranteed to all as a fundamental right and not as a privilege available to some. Mm -hmm. That abortion must be understood as the full spectrum of reproductive health care. And reproductive health care should be 
understood no differently from any other aspect of healthcare as just what it is, which is healthcare. And therefore, if you start from a rights-based approach, then everything else follows from that. Yep. Then reimbursement from insurance companies, then reimbursement from Medicaid, everything else should just be equal. And that is, at the end of the day, what it's about, understanding that all aspects of healthcare should be a guaranteed human right and anything that feeds into healthcare, that enables healthcare, which would include things like education, transportation, the economy, everything else feeds into that. But valuing the importance, the primacy of healthcare and reproductive health care as part of that is what I hope um, every presidential candidate now and beyond will value because those are our core values too. That is that is a platform that, you know, we should hope that they all can get behind. And I, th I think we're probably not too far off, though, you know, we did have a, pres a Democratic president for eight years who kept the Hyde Amendment uh, in his budgets, right? So I wonder if there's if there's particular pieces that you would pull out that you would expect people to be sort of on the record for in, in, in some way, or do you feel like it is sort of that top line and then there's the trust that they're going to kind of deliver across the board? I mean, these are the conversations that we are having internally mm -hmm. and with our progressive partners also. I mean, it's this fight that we have now is the fight of our time. And yeah. we need to look no further than President Trump's tweets <laughs> for us to see what we are up against. Yeah. And it's lies, it's yeah. misinformation, it's deception. It's just, it's, you know, it's also such hateful yeah. language mm -hmm. that it's, that I want for whoever is our next leader, actually for all of our elected leaders and for all of us, because this is not just about those in power, we should be also reclaiming the power ourselves as well, that we all must be the ones to build the world that is diverse, that's yeah. equitable, that holds as our core values about really who we are as a people. And I actually think that that's where the American people are at. I mean, we see support for Roe versus Wade higher yeah. than ever. 73% of people yeah. uh, um, understand the reason for it. and we understand what it is that we're fighting for at the end of the day. We do. And for me, as the head of Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. that fight is not about the what. It's not what we're fighting against, it's mm -hmm. who we're fighting for. Yep. And who we're fighting for are our patients and the people we serve as our North Star. Yep. Thank you. Um, I actually just got the nod that we may have time for one more question. And since we just talked about the people that we do the work for, um, so one of the questions I had on my list that I didn't think we would get to is uh, that we're both moms. And so, you know, I think part of why we're both in this work is not just for the people that we're serving who are grown-ups that can tell us the things that they need, or, but the people that are, mm -hmm. you know, that are our, our kids and our families that maybe are, you know, we're, we're anticipating what they need uh, more. Um, so if you could wave a magic wand and make something that you're fighting for now disappear before your and our kids have to fight mm. for it too. What do you think that would be? Oh, where do we start? Um, so I have, um, as we were talking about earlier, I, I, I have a one and a half year old, um, his name is Eli, who just turned one and a half. And, and I think about all the time, the world that I want to build for him um, and the generations and, and what we're doing for generations to come and the legacy that we want to leave for, for, um, for, for generations. And really it is this world where people need to have control over our own bodies and our own futures. And I would love to stop debating these topics. I mean, the Hyde Amendment, as an example, is something that comes up all the time and is so discriminatory, right? We're, yep. we're, discriminating, we're discriminating against reproductive health care. We are specifically discriminating against people of color, people with low income. Why are we still having this conversation? I want for the world that my son to grow up and I would love for him in years to come to look back and see this conversation that we're having now as some thing that's just like, oh, I can't believe that you guys had those thoughts then. I would love for him to, to say, I can't believe, you know, the world, the world that we lived in then. What, what, what is this thing? What, what, what right. were your conversations then? But I think about the fights that we have ahead. Yep. And I'll end with this, that I really believe that we have to fight with everything we have because if not us, then who? That the cavalry isn't coming. <laughs> that 
the we that we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Yep. And if we don't step up, then our children are going to be wondering, why didn't you step up then? And I don't want to look at my son in five years and ten, maybe five years, he might be too early to, uh, for him to ask me, why didn't you step up then? But, you know, in 10 years time or 15 years time, I don't want to look at him. I don't want to look at him and answer with anything other than I did everything that I could. Everyone that I knew did everything that we could because we saw that our rights and your rights and our children's rights and everybody else's rights are all on the line and that it's the fight against sexism, racism, bigotry, misogyny, homophobia, all these horrible things mm-hmm. that's happening in our country, but that we did everything we can because we are the cavalry. I think we are the cavalry is pretty much the perfect way to end. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us online. Um, we really appreciate that you made the time to be here with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks.